Welcome to EPG Patshala. We are discussing today the course on social policy and the specific module under discussion is social risk management. My name is Sohini Sengupta and I am a faculty at the School of Social Work at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. Let's look at the objectives of this module. One of the conceptual frameworks of social protection is social risk management. You were introduced to this topic in the previous module on social protection. The social risk management framework is attributed to the World Bank. What it aims to do is to create cost effective instruments in hedging the risks that vulnerable communities are exposed to. At the end of this module, the learners will understand social risk management and its conceptualization, the efficacy of social risk management as a policy measure, and how the social risk management, abbreviated as SRM tools, work to reduce vulnerability of groups and people in society. Now, what are the assumptions that underlie social risk management? There is an increasing sense that today we live in a world that comprises of a variety of risks. We are constantly feeling the risk of many things, simple things like pollution and um, environmental degradation, the risk of traffic accidents, wars and conflicts, natural hazards, you name it. However, the poorer people in the society are exposed to a certain different type or category of risk and by now you would be familiar as to what we are talking about. These exposure to diverse types of risks could be due to, again, a variety of reasons, natural hazards, political discrimination, ill health, not having obtained enough years of education, and so on. However, there are fewer instruments to deal with these risks, uh, apart from government program benefits and market support. Shocks and crises, however, have the highest consequences for the poor. So, in effect, what that means is, although all of us are exposed to a certain amount of risk in modern society, if you belong to a poorer section of the population, these risks translate into uh, what is known as catastrophes in the lives of poorer people. It is also believed by the SRM uh, framers that poor people tend to be risk averse and then they tend to avoid activities that would lead to higher economic returns in the market essentially because they are always worried about the different kinds of risks that they face all the time and what these risks would do to them. Now if these are the assumptions of SRM then how do we create instruments to deal with risks that poorer people face in the society. Under SRM framework, the sources and forms of risks are important. Uh, the framework talks about two different kinds of risks, idiosyncratic risks as against covariant risks. Idiosyncratic risks are essentially related to informal or market-based risks, whereas Covariant risks require government involvement. This is essentially because idiosyncratic risks are things that happen to individuals or persons, uh, basically one-off type of incidents, but not something that necessarily affects larger groups or population. As against covariant risks, which could be something, say for example, like an epidemic, which affects a larger group or group of population, like an entire community or a neighborhood or a city or a village. Covariant risk therefore requires government involvement. Now what are the strategies that SRM talks about? They are similar to social protection instruments. Um, however, the classification and the terminologies used in SRM are slightly different. You should be familiar with these terminologies because in uh, present day policy making context, quite a lot of uh, international funders as well as local policymakers tend to use instruments such as SRM while assessing the risks to which poorer communities are exposed to. So the different types of insurance under the SRM strategies can be classified as risk reduction mechanisms, risk mitigation mechanisms and risk coping mechanisms. These are the three main institutional arrangements for dealing with risks are exactly the same as social protection which are risks can be managed by 
depending upon informal s structures of networks of cooperation like family, kinship, etc. It could be a purchase from the market or it could be provided free of cost by governments or in other words publicly provided. Illustrations. For example, in the context of Africa, the main source of covariant risk includes HIV AIDS, war and conflict, seasonal variability of incomes, uh, volatility of food prices, drought and other types of macroeconomic shock. Now these are the types of shocks which affect large numbers of people and it is impossible for individuals to deal with these shocks based on informal networks of support. Idiosyncratic risks, however, on the other hand, could include illnesses or uh, death of the adult male member of the family, breakdown of families, etc. Access to market-based mechanisms such as savings and insurance programs, according to SRM uh, policymakers, can mitigate some effects of the risks which are seasonal or covariant. Risks may also emerge from natural uh, hazards, for example, floods or earthquakes or human activities such as economic policies leading to high inflation of food prices. Uncorrelated or idiosyncratic risks and correlated or covariant risks have low frequency but severe catastrophic or welfare effects or high frequency with low welfare effects. What that essentially means is some types of risks uh, may occur infrequently but their effects could be uh, tremendously hard on poorer people. Other types of risks which happen quite frequently like illnesses and other types of idiosyncratic risks may have lower welfare effect on population. But in real life, there is a combination of the two kinds of risks that people face, which means a large number of episodes of idiosyncratic risks might lead to a huge deficit in welfare for the individuals or groups concerned. SRM strategies are divided into three paths, prevention, mitigation and coping. Prevention essentially, as the name suggests, is meant to be implemented before a risk occurs that reduces the probability of adverse risks affecting individuals concerned. Um, examples of policies or strategies can, that can protect against these kinds of risks, for example, macroeconomic policies, environmental policies, investment in higher education, uh, malfunctioning labor markets. One can create policies to check against, uh, to prevent risks from emerging from all these various types of processes. Mitigation, these strategies are implemented also before the risk occurs. These are undertaken to reduce the impact of risk on individuals and community. For example, in farming communities, diversification of crop patterns can lead to some amount of mitigation of risks because one knows that dependence on one type of crop makes one vulnerable to both price volatility in the market as well as uh, crop failures or pest infestations and other types of issues whereas crop diversification might lead towards creating a protection for farmers who would be otherwise exposed to such types of risks. Coping are strategies that help people live through the impact of risks without much destitution. That essentially means that uh, coping strategies uh, are implemented once the risk has already uh, affected people or once people have been exposed to a certain amount of risks. Coping essentially means how does one enable individuals and groups to recover from the shocks uh, which they have received. For example, personal loan from friends and families to go through a spell of unemployment is an example of an informal risk reducing mechanism that people might use to cope with the risks to which they have been exposed to. If you want to tabulate the strategies of SRM and we put them in different columns in terms of both types of strategies, risk reducing, mitigating or preventive and also the source from where these SRM instruments would emerge, we might create a table which looks like this, right? You can fill in your own examples after making a table like this. The idea is for us to understand the kind of strategies that exist out there in the real world and see if we can categorize them according to this framework. So 
if we start with risk reduction and we look at the different sources of risk reduction strategies, um, we can look at the informal box. The informal column gives you three examples of risk reduction strategies that individuals or communities might adopt. For example, uh, one if one is a farmer or belongs to a farming community, you simply do less risky production, basically grow safe crops. Um, you could migrate to mitigate the effects to reduce the risk of depending only on agricultural uh, production or agricultural labor as an occupation and source of livelihood. In case of uh, early childhood health, you can improve feeding and weaning practices of infants in order to improve the health outcomes of children when they grow up. So these are all examples of different types of risk reducing strategies that can be uh, adopted by individuals at very less cost uh, and also dependent on their own strategies and dependence on their own neighbors and friends. If you look at market-based risk reducing strategies for the same kind of problem. Uh, you can look at things like in-service training. In-service training basically means that if you fear losing your job then you get a training in a different kind of skill or a different kind of uh, subject so that you are basically retraining yourself while you already have a job. The second type could be labor standards. Uh, organization businesses could uphold good labor standards and uh, these can act as market-based uh, risk reducing strategies. Financial literacy is another way in which people can reduce their risks because they know where to invest their money. If you look at the government column or that's the public uh, box, um, risk reducing strategies could be maintaining high labor standards which means all companies whether public or private uh, uphold a certain amount of uh, good labor standards which guarantee people a certain amount of social insur insurance, income security, safe workplace and other forms of uh, guarantees of safe uh, livelihood. Child labor reduction could be a public policy which means that children would therefore not go to work and instead go to school and therefore have better futures. Disease prevention, large scale diseases which affect a lot of people creating vulnerability can only be handled if uh, through public policies on health and therefore risk reducing strategies in the public column could involve large scale government intervention uh, such as disease control programs. If you want to look at the second type of uh, risk uh, reducing strategy in SRM which is called risk mitigation, uh, again uh, the same type of boxes have been created. Look at the informal column. Uh, to mitigate risks people can hold more than one uh, livelihood stream. They can do many jobs. Investment in human physical and social capital so people build good networks, they educate themselves, they also invest in physical property. Extended family labor contract is an example of risk mitigating strategy whereas in which you depend on your family kinship and other networks to obtain labor without having to probably pay a market price for the uh, or wages. Market based strategies could involve investment in multiple finance assets, uh, creating microfinance initiatives and different types of insurance for disability, for crops, for old age etc. that one can buy in the market to insure oneself from future risks. If you look at the public column, you'll see risk mitigation strategy could involve asset transfers. So poorer people can be helped by government by providing them with um, property rights or tenure security. Mandated insurance for disability, old age and sickness. Non-contributory pensions can be created by the government to secure people from these kinds of risks. Protection of property rights for women is an example of a public initiative which mitigates risks that women might face in case of uh, widowhood or, or abandonment or desertion or 
uh, death of the adult male earner in the family. Risk coping mechanisms uh, in the informal column, uh, basically uh, it's interesting that uh, the strategies that you see in the informal column are exactly uh, are the type of strategies that people you will find people adopting in the real world, such as selling of real assets in times of need or sending children off to work or depending on intra-community charity. In fact, it is the inadequacy of these coping mechanisms that allows the government to come in and fill in the gap wherever that has arisen historically. If you want to look at market-based strategies, selling financial assets, borrowing for, from banks, basically getting into debt could be one way in which people cope with the risks to which they have uh, succumbed. Public interventions could be something like a disaster relief that is provided by governments when large communities are affected by natural hazards, conditional or unconditional transfers in cash and kind made to people in need, uh, organizing public work programs and subsidizing various types of goods and services are also examples of SRM strategies which fall within the box of risk coping mechanisms. A key concept in SRM is uh, the notion of vulnerability. Vulnerability is uh, slightly different from poverty. It essentially implies a high level of probability of not only being poor but remaining poor for a really long period of time. It also incorporates within its understanding uh, the idea that various people who are usually counted as non-poor can also become poor over a period of time because of the variety of risks to which they are exposed. Vulnerability refers to household ability or inability to smooth consumption when faced with income volatility which essentially means that these are households that would be unable to mitigate or cope with the risks if their income sources are uh, insecure or fluctuate uh, over a period of time. Based on gaps in access to an efficiency of risk management instruments available to the poor, the notion of vulnerability takes a different shape because it's also the highly vulnerable people are also those to whom uh, social security uh, provisions or social protection uh, mechanisms, transfers in cash and kind are not reaching properly. Uh, the inability to obtain these uh, transfers also make people vulnerable. There's a risk vulnerability assessment methodology which the World Bank and the SRM policy framers have created which can enable organizations or, or groups or societies to understand, to map the extent to which uh, groups and communities face the risks and to what extent are they vulnerable. Some of the key questions that are asked in risk vulnerability assessments include what are the main sources of vulnerability to poverty? What kind of shocks cause the largest damage? Comparing these risks to the available public intervention aimed at managing the social risks, the idea is to understand if certain types of risks are already present in society and if certain groups of people are already vulnerable to those risks, then try and map these against the public interventions that exist to address these risks and see whether uh, gaps in terms of access, affordability, reach, etc. exists between the two, two of these things. Listing out the policy gaps, that is the list of interventions required to address the vulnerability and manage the risk using different institutions and arrangements for the same. So basically the kind of, uh, kind of tables that we showed in the previous slides, these are the kind of matrices that are created to sort of map out the main sources of vulnerability, the different types of population who are at risks, the type of risks these are, and the kind of public interventions that exist in order to understand whether there are enough strategies existing to deal with these vulnerabilities and the extent to which these strategies are being successful in dealing with them. Some of the criticisms of SRM include um, that it lacks an analytical structure that is required to assess a combination of risks and their impact. Some risks have impact that are irreversible, therefore making risk management uh, following the occurrence of risk very difficult. Uh, take for example 
uh, something like an epidemic which might lead to uh, a large number of populations simply dying and making it very difficult to create risk management strategies because uh, the, the population, the vulnerable population and focus no longer exists. The SRM framework does not include strategies that do not reduce the probability of risk but mitigates the effects of shocks that result from such risks. This is a big criticism. According to this view, uh, one needs to assess the extent to which these risks can be managed in the first place. It's not enough to deal with it once these have happened. So the lack of uh, preparedness part of it in this framework, which means the inability to anticipate or the lack of commitment to, to create strategies to deal with the situation till something has happened to people makes this a uh, strategy which is uh, post facto may not be effective in reducing vulnerability. Some of the key terms in the SRM framework such as risk, shock, effects and impacts are not elaborated or well defined. Once if these terms are not elaborated or well defined, the trouble is that one may not be able to use these as operational definitions to create uh, measures that, that are countable. And if you are unable to do that, it would be difficult to understand uh, the extent to which risks exist and uh, you know map them or match them with public interventions and uh, you know measure the extent to which public interventions or informal mechanisms or market-based mechanisms are working or not working in it a particular society. The SRM framework does not acknowledge normative concepts as social minimum standards or that social protection was a fundamental right of all citizens. This by far is one of the more uh, broader or uh, philosophical uh, disagreements with a strategy which is highly instrumental in the sense that it kicks into action only when something happens to people and it has nothing to say about the responsibility of states uh, to responsibility of states or legal entitlements of citizens or the broader philosophy and the need to create redistribution or justice. Here, uh, the language of uh, risks and the language of mitigation makes the whole exercise to be uh, far more uh, simplistic than um, uh, social policy measures are supposed to be. It also makes it really narrowly defined and uh, some people are worried that this may not lead to satisfactory outcomes because social problems and social issues are, are complex and they are highly interrelated. Targeting and dealing with some amount of risk does not necessarily do away with the larger uh, instabilities or insecurities that communities and nations might experience. As the framework tends to focus on income risks and household strategies to manage the shock that results from it. It does not focus on chronic poverty, which, is, which again means that chronically poor people have been poor for a really long time, which means their vulnerabilities are both long-standing as well as uh, deep, deep in terms of intensity. And um, SRM has nothing to say about chronic poverty. It doesn't have much to say also about multidimensional nature of poverty. You are familiar with these concepts from uh, the module that we have studied on poverty. It may be very difficult for chronically poor households to manage their risks without additional promotive social protection uh, provided by the state. Therefore, uh, while Poor people may appear to be coping with the risks through informal arrangement that is not necessarily always the most uh, satisfactory in terms of social policy outcomes provided one basis one's uh, decisions on broader normative goals and not on narrow understanding of risk and mitigation. With this, we come to an end on uh, the module on uh, social risk management. To briefly summarize what we have studied and understood, social risk management is a strategy of understanding social protection based on uh, the mechanisms and framework for analysis created by the World Bank in the early 2000. The idea was to identify 
vulnerable groups and people in a society and try to see the kind of risks that these uh, groups and people and individuals and households experience, uh, the manner in which these groups deal with the risk, the different types of instruments that were available to them uh, to handle these risks and the gaps that existed between uh, individual and household strategies, market-based instruments and public intervention and whether these were able to meet their goals or not. We have also looked at some of the uh, some of the ways in which SRM classifies uh, social problems. Uh, we looked at the key criticisms against SRM which among which is the criticism that it uh, tends to neglect the normative goals of social policy and the other criticism is that the operational definitions are not sharply uh, put forth which makes it very difficult to implement it in the real life situation. Uh, with that we come to the end of this module. Thank you very much for your time. You are encouraged to look at a large number of literature that exists on social risk management including the handbook that is written by uh, Robert Holzman and uh, which is called Social Risk Management and is published by the World Bank. And uh, you're, also look, you're also encouraged to read Leopard G's uh, Social Risk Management Strategies and Health Risk Exposure, which gives you a large number of examples in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, which demonstrates how SRM works in situations that SRM works and in context where SRM fails to provide an accurate understanding of social problems. Thank you.